Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, friends of the Faculty of Law, colleagues. Uh, I'm Robert Leckie, the Dean of the Law Faculty, uh, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to the 2017 Briarley Memorial Lecture. Today we commemorate the life and work of the late Professor John E.C. Briarley, a former Dean of the Faculty and one of the greatest Canadian experts on domestic and international arbitration. I think of him often, most recently because uh, just a few days ago, we hung in the foyer to the Dean's office a map of France that was given to Professor Briarley when he completed his mandate as Dean. And hanging beside it, the back page we removed, but it's a list of all the signatures of his colleagues who expressed their appreciation and wished him well on that occasion. And the map was recently returned to us. It was gifted to the Faculty of Law's Wainwright Fund by his daughter, Dorothy Durnford, who many times over is a graduate of McGill University. So I pass that many times a day, and I think of John Briarley. Also, titulaire de la chair Sir William C. Macdonald, il est difficile d'imaginer une carrière plus brillante que celle de cet éminent universitaire dont on se souvient ce soir. Au-delà de son implication à la faculté dans les domaines du droit privé et du droit comparé, the Professor Briarley a été également membre de l'exécutif de la Canadian Society for Legal History, de la section canadienne, de l'Inter-American Commercial Arbitration Commission, du Conseil national, de la Fondation canadienne des droits de la personne et de la délégation canadienne d'experts auprès d'Uni Droit. In one of his last articles devoted to arbitration, and of course he wrote on many other things, Professor Briarley focused on equity and good conscience in Canadian ar arbitration law. I think the article shows clearly why he was interested in arbitration. The language of difference and divergence, at the time usually found in the scholarship of comparative law, becomes in the context of arbitration for John Briarley, a language of reconciliation, cross-fertilization, and convergence. And this is so because this mechanism of dispute resolution accounts for one of the highest levels of hybridization of legal traditions. After addressing how the common law and civil law traditions were able to find a common understanding of amiable composition, a type of arbitration where the parties authorize the arbitrators to decide the dispute without being bound to the black letter of some system of positive law, he observed, is this not remarkable? And it makes me think of exams written by our students here uh, in our integrated program. We might take here for granted the high degree of harmony and coexistence among Canada's legal traditions. But that's not the case everywhere, and it didn't happen overnight. It's worth remembering then how far we have journeyed. And I think that idea of cross-fertilization and convergence and reconciliation can serve as an example when we think of a number of issues, including the role of indigenous legal traditions and the rich insights and knowledge that they can bring. And our students present in the room tonight, I think, are alert to the implications of such a holistic approach to the study of law. Uh, and I think they will keep alive this idea of harmonization in coherence with the works of Professor Briarley. Enfin, permettez-moi de souligner qu'à travers les 15 dernières années, la conférence commémorative Briarley a devenu un événement incontournable pour les spécialistes d'arbitrage en Amérique du Nord, tout comme en Europe. Cette réussite n'aurait pas été possible sans les efforts de mes collègues, le professeur Fabien Gélina, Andrea Bjorklund, Geneviève Sommier, Kun Fan et Armand de Montreal. Je voudrais aussi souligner les apports de notre ancien collègue, l'honorable Frédéric Bachan. Merci pour votre grand travail. Sans plus tarder, je laisse la parole maintenant au professeur Fabien Gélina, lui-même titulaire de la chaire Sir William C. Macdonald et directeur de l'équipe de recherche Justice privée et État de droit. Fabien laissera ensuite la parole à maître Pierre-Olivier Savoie, un diplômé de cette faculté et ancien collaborateur de notre conférencière pour nous présenter la professeure Lucy Reed. Je vous souhaite tous et toutes une excellente conférence et bienvenue à la faculté de droit de Miguel. Merci Robert, bonsoir à, à tous. C'est avec beaucoup de plaisir que je joins ma voix à celle du doyen pour vous souhaiter la bienvenue à cet événement qui prend une importance grandissante dans le calendrier intellectuel de cette faculté et le calendrier très chargé de la communauté arbitrale 
à travers le monde. Euh, C'est un événement euh, qui suscite beaucoup d'émotions euh, et je voudrais euh, en profiter pour, euh, pour souligner la présence de Tim Briley, euh, le fils de John E.C. Briley qui est avec nous ce soir. Et je voudrais aussi euh, souligner la présence de Yves Fortier, notre premier conférencier euh, Briley, euh, qui euh, a par la suite mis sur pied euh, le Briley euh, Fund. Alors, je vais revenir sur euh, euh, nos commanditaires, nos parrains, euh, le cabinet Woods, à la fin de la conférence. Euh, Lucy Reed a accepté de donner ce soir cette conférence euh, à l'occasion du congrès de l'ICA à Maurice. C'était euh, lors d'un cocktail euh, sous les palmiers. C'était en mai euh, 2016. Uh, she was transitioning at the time from a global law firm life to a global university life. Understandably, she was reluctant to make too many commitments. Entered one of our numerous alumni who practice international arbitration. I meet them everywhere. Uh, he'd known her well through working closely with her on arbitration matters. And he's the one who really clinched it for McGill for his alma mater. So it gives me great pleasure to let uh, Pierre-Olivier Savoie introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Pierre-Olivier se spécialise en arbitrage international, en droit international et en litige international depuis qu'il a reçu son double diplôme de notre faculté en 2005. Il a été secrétaire juridique ou law clerk à la Cour suprême du Canada et à la Cour internationale de justice à La Haye. C'est un fait d'armes assez uh, impressionnant et assez rare, je pense. Uh, he has worked at uh, White and Case in New York and at Fresh Fields in Paris. He also spent four years with the Government of Canada's Trade Law Bureau, where he defended several NAFTA Chapter 11 arbitrations and negotiated over a dozen investment treaties. And that includes the investment chapter of CETA, uh, which will be uh, an important uh, subject matter for our lecture tonight. At the beginning of 2016, Pierre-Olivier uh, founded his own law firm. I met him very, uh, very shortly after that, and I congratulated him on his great uh, courage and determination. His firm is called Savoy Arbitration, and uh, he works out of both Ottawa and Paris. He uh, currently, currently acts as lead counsel in both commercial and investment treaty arbitrations. Alors, je donne avec plaisir et sans plus tarder la parole à Pierre-Olivier Savoie. Merci beaucoup, euh, Monsieur le Professeur Gélina, euh, Monsieur le Doyen, Monsieur Briarly, Monsieur Fortier, Lucy, euh, chers étudiants, euh, confrères, euh, mesdames et messieurs. Euh, au cours des 30 dernières années, Lucy a été une pionnière, non seulement de l'arbitrage international, mais de la résolution des différents internationaux sous toutes ses formes. Comme vous allez le voir, ou plutôt l'entendre, Lucy ne s'est jamais arrêtée, elle n'a jamais arrêté ses intérêts seulement à l'arbitrage. C'est tout à son honneur. Lucy est currently director for the Center of International Law and professor on the law faculty of the National University of Singapore. She retired, as Professor Gilina mentioned, in 2016 from uh, Freshfields, the international law firm, where she led the international arbitration and public international law groups with over 150 lawyers dedicated to those areas, including myself at the time. So, and she is rated in band one for international arbitration in Chambers Global and Chambers Asia. And Lucy has also represented private and public clients in cutting-edge commercial and investment treaty arbitrations. Lucy is a vice president of the ICC court, a member of the Singapore International Arbitration Center, 
Court, which, as you will see, is of particular interest today, and chair of the ICA Governing Board Congress Committee. She also formerly served as chair of the Institute for Transnational Arbitration and president of the American Society of International Law. Lucy is also a member of the panels of the CIRDI, the SIAC, and of several other centers of arbitrage. She has also been commissioner of the Commission Mixte Eritrea Ethiopia, a commission of the international law and has co-dirigeed the Claims Resolution Tribunal for the comptes en déshérence in Suisse, the first tribunal of the Holocaust. In the public function, Lucy has been the principal principal du Korean Peninsula Energy Development Organization, où elle a mené des négociations avec la Corée du Nord, ce qui, comme on sait, n'est pas une mince tâche. Elle a aussi travaillé au bureau du Legal Advisor au département d'État américain à Washington et en tant qu'agent des États-Unis au tribunal des réclamations irano-américain à La Haye. Among her many publications, Lucy is co-author of A Guide to the SIAC Arbitration Rules, Guide to Exit Arbitration, and the Freshfields Guide to Arbitration Clauses in International Contracts. C'est pour moi un grand plaisir, en particulier dans le contexte des conférences Briar Lee et Almond Alma Mater, de vous présenter Lucy. Je n'ai aucun doute que ce qu'elle va nous dire aujourd'hui est non seulement intéressant et important, mais pourrait également nous donner des indices sur la direction que prendra la résolution des différents internationaux au cours des prochaines années. Lucy, la parole est à toi. Ah, bonsoir à tous. Il y a longtemps que je parle français, peut-être 30 ans. Alors, now I will speak English. Uh, and say, thank you. Thank you to Dean Lecky and Professor Gelinas and uh, Pierre Olivier. And special thanks to Pierre Olivier because the price he had to pay for twisting my arm uh, when I was in transition to take on this, uh, this lecture is he helped me with the research and, and the uh, preparation, and I am uh, indebted to him for that. I, unfortunately, did not know Professor Brierly, uh, which, from what I've picked up in reading and talking before the lecture, I uh, think is my great loss. And I'm honored, I'm truly honored, to be invited to give this public lecture on international arbitration established in his name. Uh, and I'm honored to be amongst the ranks, and I consider them very high, of the first Briarly lecturer, uh, Yves Fortier, and the late um, Professor Andy Lowenfeld from NYU, whom I, I actually miss dearly. Now, I, I do know Canada somewhat, and I'm pleased to be back, especially in Montreal. My travel here uh, made me think of some of my memories of trips to Canada, and it's, that's a lot of time when you come from Singapore uh, to Montreal to think about things. Uh, I was thinking about a case I did as a young litigator where everybody's name except mine, uh, and the plaintiff was Louis, uh, which was confusing. Uh, but then I, I focused more on I decided I would share with you only two anecdotes that have to do with border crossings. Uh, when I, you're not gonna believe this story, but this is true. I'm an exaggerator, but this is true. When I was a camp counselor in the Adirondacks, uh, on a day off visit to Montreal, I found that when we came to the border crossing, I had no picture ID whatsoever. And the, <laughs> The border guard accepted the name tag in the back of my t-shirt uh, as proof that I was who I was. Now, we've come a long way since those days. And many years later, in 1995, I think at the same border crossing, was the one time that I saw my husband, who's not a lawyer, play legal advocate. Um, and that is because we were driving from New York to Montreal, to Toronto actually, so different border crossing, to Toronto to visit friends. And we had a case of US wine with us. And when we, we got to the border crossing, my husband confidently declared the wine 
and was shocked that he was charged duty. The amount seemed to be twice the value of the wine, although I might be making the tale taller than it really is. So as he walked to the office to uh, protest and pay, he was announcing loudly to everyone around, what about NAFTA? Don't you know about NAFTA? What's with NAFTA? Um, the officials were neither amused nor swayed by his oral arguments. So we, uh, we had to pay the tax. <laughs> now, now, having learned a lesson, which I remembered uh, yesterday when we did come through the border crossing, I was asked by the, the border agent, now, do you have any alcohol or tobacco or drugs? And I thought for a minute, and I, oh, I remembered this day, and I felt I should be truthful, and I said, well, we have a half a bottle of wine in the car. And he looked serious, and he said, I mean, I'm thinking, how many laws have I violated to have an open half bottle of wine in my car at a border crossing? So he said, he said, uh, he smiled a bit and he said, what happened to the other half? <laughs> and I said, well, it was served at the engagement party for our daughter in New York on Saturday. And he finally did smile and let us through. So here I am, fortunately, not, not in jail. But more, more seriously, Canada, uh, deserves its reputation as a leader in international uh, arbitration and the torchbearer for transparency in investment treaty arbitration. And I think perhaps sometimes that, that Meg Kinnear is your best export uh, from Canada. And let me now, oops, I shouldn't be this far along. Let me now uh, introduce my topic. And I want to be clear at the beginning on terminology, because by the, by the phrase international dispute resolution courts in my lecture title, I actually only mean international courts with jurisdiction to resolve commercial disputes, both trade and investment disputes. I'm not tonight addressing, uh, well, maybe we'll call them public international law, courts like the International Court of Justice or uh, ITLOS or human rights courts. Uh, I should have been more precise. Now on the one side, on the investment side, the call for new international investment courts, effectively the judicialization of treaty arbitration, has its origin in dissatisfaction with the perceived status quo. This dissatisfaction, I hardly need to tell you, is wide and deep and very loud. The costs are too high, the proceedings are too slow, the arbitrator selection is too opaque, tribunals are too homogenous, uh, conflicts of interest uh, and issue conflict have become scandalous. And on the other side, if you will, on the trade side, this dissatisfaction from investment treaty arbitration is bleeding over into commercial arbitration, fueled, I think, in part by the substantial overlap of the players, the council, the companies and parties, the arbitrators, and even the institutions now. We've seen an increase, or at least I have seen an increase, in uh, talking about taking vanilla commercial disputes, international commercial disputes, to domestic courts instead of to international arbitration. And the debates have been shifting, although they're still quite heated, they've been shifting to the comparative advantages of standing courts over traditional ad hoc tribunals. And we see this obviously in the trajectory of the EU initiatives for first and second instance investment courts. I don't know which adjective to use, the, I think, endless commentary at conferences and the growing stack of articles and blogs beside my desk uh, recently had got me thinking, how much, stepping back from this, how much are the proponents of courts over arbitration looking backwards? In other words, romanticizing the 
uh, aspects of domestic court litigation with which we litigators, uh, and most of us started as litigators, are most comfortable. How much are they willing to look forward and not just think about domestic courts? How much are they willing to look forward and explore new and innovative court structures for international commercial justice? Hence the other half of my title, retreat or advance. And to save you suspense, uh, you won't be surprised, I'm in favor of advance. And later in the lecture, I propose to illustrate advance to you by highlighting another category of court with the new hybrid Singapore International Commercial Court, uh, the SICC. I can't bring myself, unlike others in Singapore, to call it the SIC because I think that's an unfortunate acronym. Um, so SICC stands for Singapore International Commercial Court. It hasn't received much notice outside of Asia, uh, at least since its launch in 2015. And I'm not, I'm not here to sell the Singapore court to you. It's going to have to sell itself on the merits. But I do want to fill you in on its nature uh, and its progress. And that is because I see the court as something of a dark horse. Uh, worth knowing about outside of Singapore because it may catch up, uh, may even overtake in certain categories of cases, uh, commercial arbitration and FTA investment courts. So my thesis uh, is that international businesses expect and deserve a wide choice of first rate dispute resolution mechanisms. And where there are first-class domestic courts uh, that are available for cross-border disputes, which is very rarely, parties are free to use them. And where the local courts are not up to the standards of Canada uh, or New York, uh, then parties are going to continue to use international commercial arbitration. For investment treaty uh, disputes, it seems to me that we have to be prepared to accept the new investment court system. That's initial caps, investment court system. Uh, another unfortunate acronym, ICS, uh, which I won't use. But also, but also, we should be open to uh, existing and new hybrids of domestic, domestic international commercial courts. So, as necessary background, uh, I won't spend much time on it, but I want to start with, with what I call the arbitration versus courts versus investment courts debate. Um, it's kind of a big debate, so I, I wasn't quite sure where to start to start, so I thought, why not with Professor Brierley? And in 1992, I found he wrote the preface to a special edition of the McGill Law Journal on international arbitration where he covered everything from the, or studies were in that, were in that um, volume, everything from classic commercial arbitration to the new, more public types of arbitration with the Canada US FTA and the UN Compensation Commission. Uh, and he talked about, and let, let me say, I just have a very few slides which I'm using to put up quotes because I know you can read faster than I can speak and a few things to keep you awake. What Professor Briley spoke about was a paradox in the arbitration phenomenon uh, that it's used as a means for the privatization of dispute settlement for private persons and also as a mechanism adaptable to the resolution of disputes involving actors that are public entities or implicating mixed public and private concerns. Now, this really resonated with me because as Pierre Olivier um, mentioned, I've divided my career between private and public international dispute resolution and the private and public sectors and even gave Haig lectures on mixed private and public international law solutions uh, to international crises, which was rather a grand title, I must say. But today, 
I think Professor Brierley's paradox is magnified. The private and public branches of international arbitration have ever more influence on each other. It's very hard to separate. Now, treaty arbitration gets the most attention because, and the most, the worst whippings, if you will, because it is the most public. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time this evening, though, on the battleground of investor state dispute settlement, that's ISDS uh, for any newcomers, or on the details of the new investment courts under the Canada-EU trade agreement, CETA, or the EU-Vietnam FTA, uh, or the prospects for some grand, somehow, multilateral, um, worldwide investment court. I think that's familiar territory. A lot of people are lecturing about this topic, uh, thinking about it and arguing about it. When I, when I finally agree <laughs> to do a distinguished lecture like this, I see it as the opportunity or really the responsibility to learn something I don't know uh, or to teach myself more about something that I should know. And here I assign myself the task of exploring whether this arbitration versus courts versus investment courts debates could illuminate the prospects for international commercial courts. And this is important for those of you who haven't come across this animal. By international commercial courts, what I'm talking about are international divisions of domestic courts. They're international sections of municipal courts that have jurisdiction over private international commercial disputes and potentially uh, investment treaty and investment contract disputes. So let me first address and put aside uh, quickly the idea, which is circulating, of taking more international commercial disputes to regular domestic courts, if I can use that phrase. This is a retreat from international commercial justice, if I've seen one. Uh, it is true that the EU takes the position that intra-EU disputes can and should go to EU courts, excellent EU member state courts, um, but in reading about that or thinking about that, there's an inconvenient fact, which is that the parties from EU member states have been able for decades to go to other EU uh, courts, and they've instead opted for arbitration. And as we see, I think, from Belgium, they want to continue to opt for arbitration. It's also true that we Westerners, those of us here, know and like and deservedly respect our independent and high quality courts. Why wouldn't we want to litigate international disputes in our familiar courthouses with our familiar rules? Uh, why can't our counterparties, say from West, Western Africa, see the benefits of that? Well, wait, they say. Wait, we're proud of our courts as well. Uh, and by the way, public trials of international cases would help build the rule of law in our country, so why not come to us? Why insist on private justice? Um, to borrow a statement from Lord Goff, there really is a veritable jungle of separate, broadly based jurisdictions all over the world, good, bad, and mediocre, and they're not designed to resolve transnational commercial uh, disputes fairly. As for investment disputes, we have to acknowledge, of course, the injustice, including judicial injustice, in so much of the developing world where the foreign investments take place. Before I move from, um, what would I call it, uh, judicial nationalism, uh, it's worth, though, listening to that that discussion, it's worth asking ourselves why there is this stubborn contingent, maybe the neo-Calvoists, who would retreat from international arbitration back to the domestic courts. What factors might objectively make domestic litigation better than international arbitration? 
Uh, and I actually don't think that's very hard to answer. My core list, which I'll put up, uh, is short. It's the safety net of an appeal when the decision maker appears to be wrong. I think many of the practitioners in this room in arbitration have received quite wrong uh, decisions with no appellate avenue. Uh, second, the independence and accountability of sitting judges answerable to the public rather than ad hoc arbitrators answerable only to the parties. Third, transparency for all but genuinely confidential information. And fourth, common codes of ethics for judges and counsel. Uh, and I'm not including, on purpose, the factors of time and cost and efficiency that we hear so much about because really they don't matter in multi-hundred million dollar disputes. That's not the core of the current problem. Enforceability of judgments, of awards, does matter, and I will return to that. Now, I'm indebted to uh, Maitre Fortier for a segue from domestic courts over here to international investment courts and appellate bodies. These have been on treaty drawing boards for decades, and now they're coming to life, or they're trying to come to life under CETA and the, the EU Vietnam FTA. Treaty draftsmen and women are now moving on to follow on FTAs and, as, as I said, the gold ring of one multilateral investment court. Now, no doubt, much of the attraction of an international investment court lies in its similarity to a national court system, at least the leading common law and civil law systems. And Eve highlighted this in his preface to a transnational dispute management special edition on CETA uh, last year. And he said, or he wrote in brief, uh, resistance to the investor state dispute settlement system is pulling in two opposite directions toward a partial renationalization of available recourses, not resources, recourses on the one hand, and toward what is viewed as a greater internationalization of dispute resolution based on a court model. But what looks like a vote of confidence for internationalization may be closer to a vote for a certain kind of institutionalization, a kind, of, a kind that's modeled on domestic courts. The intensity, uh, well, these are measured words, but the intensity outside these words of the treaty arbitration versus investment court uh, debate is rather startling. You've seen probably the sensational media accounts of illegitimate justice in secret hearings and dominance of the Fortune 100. Um, speaking with more perspective, but still with drama, Philippe Pinsol recently has taken the view that defending international arbit I'm sorry, investment arbitration is a lost battle. So I have a slide just to keep you awake. A lost battle that's largely ideological, if not emotional, and the perception is that private arbitration no longer passes the legitimacy threshold. The only answer, says Philippe, is a court system. Now, others are leading the charge to defend ISDS with equally dramatic language. There's the charge. Uh, leading the charge, uh, don't tell him I said this, is, oh, it's on videotape, sorry, is Judge Stephen Schwebel, uh, who's written that investment court proposals smack of appeasement, of uninformed criticism of ISDS rather than sound judgment. He objects that the EU investment tribunal regime would replace, and I quote, a system, arbitration, that on any objective analysis works reasonably well with a system that would face substantial problems, and it's a long list, of coherence, rationalization, negotiation, ratification, establishment, functioning, and financing. Now, Albert Jan Vandenberg, known to several of you, is a more laconic Dutchman, and what he has said is that the provisions in the EU-Vietnam FTA treaty on courts are utterly incomprehensible. 
and nonsensical. But the ICS, the investment court system, does represent a radical change away from the decentralized ISDS regime that we've seen grow up over the past two decades with ad hoc party appointed tribunals. And if you take CETA, for those of you who don't know it, especially students, if you take CETA as an example, what you have basically is a standing court with conflict of interest rules, like domestic systems, no double hatting. Uh, court members who are appointed for five-year terms by the EU and Canada, one-third from the EU, one-third from Canada, one-third from what I call ROW, rest of the world, other countries, and an appellate review mechanism. In CETA, the court will have jurisdiction only in relation to the investment obligations of fair and equitable treatment and compensation for expropriation. National treatment, MFN, other uh, protections will be left out in the cold, subject to state to state dispute resolution. Some see that as an advance, others of us as a retreat uh, in international adjudication. But whether you like it or not, uh, whether you like the investment court concept or not, no one can ignore the magnitude of practical obstacles that are involved in setting up any such court. How are you going to manage civil and common law cases, substantively and procedurally? How are you going to write the rules? Who's going to write the rules? And how, this is what most people talk about the most, how to select and entice to serve a bench of judges that is suitably international, qualified, available, and diverse. Um, we've seen this complicated algebra or calculus with the International Criminal Court. Now, in this space, it's a bit of theory, in this space, you might find interesting the scholarship of Jeffrey Dunoff and Mark Pollock. Uh, at a panel on international judicial values at the meeting of the annual society, I'm sorry, the annual meeting of the American Society of International Law this year, they propounded their judicial trilemma, uh, which I've put up on a slide. An international court, they say, can maximize only two of the triangle of core agreed values, judicial independence, judicial accountability, judicial transparency. Uh, for example, if a judge is to be truly independent, think independently, make decisions independently, and accountable to whomever appointed him or her and the parties, then it would be best not to be too transparent and let everybody see, let everybody see what went into the decision because then it will be attacked. Uh, in a way that it can't be if we've got transparency. I think FTA drafters ought to be pondering this trilemma. Now, in my view, I think this is exaggerated and the practical obstacles of establishing an international investment court are surmountable with more or less happy results. And I want to drop two footnotes here. One is that the Iran US Claims Tribunal mentioned by Pierre Olivier can provide a number of clues on how to launch an international investment court, even in a political minefield, and the early history ought to be dusted, dusted off. And second, I, am, I really am surprised that the debate about how to find qualified permanent investment dispute judges, uh, which sometimes is self-interested, let's say that, uh, rarely, if ever, touches upon the obvious solution of training, training the judges who are selected in investment law and in arbitration or adjudication procedure. If we can teach this subject to hundreds of LLMs, uh, then I think we can teach very good commercial lawyers and even professors uh, who are willing to serve on the new courts because uh, judiciaries do this all the time. Training new judges and continuing training is part and parcel of a, um, a stable 
excellent judiciary. So those footnotes are done. Now, I'm the first to say that these looming investment, court, investment courts will not be perfect, um, but I do think that uh, they'll at least provide certain, certain of the objectively best aspects of domestic litigation, that's appellate rights, a stable and accountable bench, public jurisprudence, um, and also provide certain of the best parts of international arbitration, IBA discovery and confidentiality, for example. And the mixed nature of these courts, investment courts, says to me that they'll be in advance um, if they work out well. They won't be a retreat to traditional litigation, maybe just a modest advance. Uh, and let's be gracious this evening and assume that this system will work well uh, and not lose sight in this debate, which is so uh, virulent lately, that it is not a zero-sum game. Uh, there's not going to be one winner. Arbitration will continue, and these courts will get started, I think, and we'll still need arbitration. Uh, Johnny Beter put it very well, as he always does, uh, in discussing uh, TTIP last year in his Alexander lecture, and I don't have a slide, but what he said is, there is some idea that investment arbitration can somehow be morphed with an international investment court so as to produce the best of all possible worlds. This is a grave mistake. Consensual arbitration and court proceedings are two very different creatures. If users want arbitration, arbitration will continue. So now I'm going to leave the arbitration versus courts versus investment courts debate. Uh, and I'll borrow Johnny's words and I'll say, what if we could find something close to the best of all possible worlds? And this is where I turn to the hybrid of international commercial courts, a rare hybrid. And I'll start with a definition because it's new to a lot of people. Uh, I take this from VK Raja, who's the immediate past attorney general uh, in Singapore in an arbitration international article. Uh, and it's a short definition. Uh, an international commercial court it is a domestic court rooted in the legal system of the home jurisdiction, specially created, specially tailored in terms of structure and personnel. The international profile of these domestic courts comes from their caseload, their bench, their bar, and their rules. So what are the desirable traits of an international commercial court? You can have a long list or a short list, but I'm going to go with the list, a medium-length list, set out by Sir William Blair, who is the judge in charge of the London Commercial Court. And this comes from a lecture uh, he gave last year. He wasn't, at, he wasn't talking about courts. He was talking about dispute uh, resolution. And he lists eight components. You can read them uh, yourselves. But certainty is the application of ascertainable legal principles. Accessibility, no artificial barriers for claims. Predictability, that's the application of known procedures. Transparency, party awareness of what's going on. Uh, independence, this is important. Independence is underpinned by transparency, uh, so there's no suspicion of, of dependence. And then, of course, we have experience, efficiency, outcome, and a possible ninth, he says, which is reasonable cost. Uh, when I, I'll be adding to this list when we've looked specifically uh, at courts. What international arbitration, arbitration, I'm sorry, what international commercial courts really exist? The main ones are the London Commercial Court, the DIFCC in Dubai, I have them up on, on the globe here, and the Singapore Court. These were mentioned by The Economist last week, actually, in an article on court competition, a new phenomenon. Uh, the London Commercial Court is the grand dame here. It's been in existence since 1895. It's very international. Over 50% of its cases involve only foreign parties, and more than 80%, at least one non-UK party. It's got 900 new cases a year. The reason for this success, of course, is that English commercial law is the basis for many, many uh, international transactions. 
Okay, fine. But is it an international commercial court as we know the world post 1895, 1945, and 2008? Uh, and with, with due respect, and I'm, <laughs> I mean that genuinely, not in the English advocate's usage, with due respect, I think not. Uh, it may have an international outlook, but it's an English court with English judges, with English procedure, with English counsel. And there's nothing wrong with that for certain purposes. Um, and I, I don't even need to accept the easy charge that the London Commercial Court is sort of a remnant of Commonwealth traditions to say, I don't think that it is a viable option or model for other courts, especially in Asia. Um, and I, I say this, <laughs> I say this tongue in cheek, um, I should say, but how culturally sensitive can such an English, English, English institution be when after all the Financial Times reported to us last week that, that Theresa May, Prime Minister, on an official visit to Tokyo with a lot of businesses to try to get business refused to do karaoke. Uh, she just said, I'm afraid, I, I won't do karaoke, don't care how much business. Uh, so that's tongue in cheek. Now there's also this whole suite of international commercial courts in the Gulf. The Dubai International Financial Center courts are the oldest, they're from 2008. There's one in Qatar and one in Abu Dhabi. Um, only international recently, the Dubai court, because originally it was just for disputes in the special jurisdiction of the, of the Dubai Financial Center, which is a uh, jurisdiction carved out there, uh, but since 2011, it's tried to become international by allowing consent jurisdiction. Um, again, I have to ask the question, how international are they? Because given that all three of these courts are motivated by attracting business to the Gulf and are English rooted, common law rooted, uh, I don't think that they're really international commercial courts. Now there are other incentives, I won't go through them in detail. The Dutch are now going to have a division of the court in Amsterdam working in English on commercial disputes connected to the Netherlands. India has now got commercial court uh, legislation. And in Francophone Africa, there's the new core commune of Ohara. Ohara now has 17 member states and is trying to harmonize international business law under uniform acts, and the court ha is an arbitration institution and a court of final uh, instance on any disputes under these uniform acts. Now this is not even the whole roundup. Uh, I was surprised to learn that there is actually a standing international forum of commercial courts, which met for the first time uh, this spring, of course, in London. Uh, and over 25 courts, commercial courts from five continents were represented. I was trying to make a slide to show all the 25 cities, uh, and yes, Canada is on there through Ontario, but I couldn't, so I'm just giving you the globe. Um, <laughs> there, there are more and more coming. Now, are these advances or retreats in international dispute resolution? Uh, it's too soon to tell. It's too, too, it's too soon to tell if they'll have cases. Uh, but it's not too soon to tell that they're already competing for cases. And Judge Blair of the London Commercial Court has observed that there's this competitive environment, that's why The Economist is writing about it, um, in which these courts and commercial actors are trying to, and I quote, encourage use of their particular dispute resolution mechanisms in more of a sales pitch than an attempt at analysis. Um, he, also, he also acknowledges that this is new blood and there are new ideas, so maybe it's a start towards an advance. I wouldn't put my money uh, on the chances of success of so many courts, even if they try to stay regional or intend to stay regional, because this audience knows how many hundreds, literally hundreds of arbitration institutions there are in the world with nothing to do uh, but pitch for business. And now, if I may, I want to move finally 
money to Singapore. Uh, I would put my money on the Singapore International Commercial Court, and not just because I live there. Uh, it's because Singapore has succeeded so brilliantly with Maxwell Chambers, which is the first integrated arbitration dispute resolution building, with the Singapore International Arbitration Center and the Mediation Center. Singapore is investing, continues to invest substantial funds and talent towards becoming the leading international dispute resolution center in Asia and one of the best globally. And while we've been caught up on these debates about investment courts versus arbitration, who's going to survive, the court has quietly been going about its business and starting to fulfill ambitions that are a lot greater than the Dubai or London courts. A um, quick bit of history. Singapore established the court in just two years ago, in January 2015, as a separate division of the High Court, the Court of First Instance in Singapore, to hear cases that are international, commercial, uh, and offshore, definitions to follow. At that time, Chief Justice Menon, who many of you, anyone who knows Chief Justice Menon knows he's the invisible hand behind all this, emphasized the court's substantive reach, and he has emphasized that the SICC is envisioned as a forum dedicated only, only to international commercial disputes. Unlike the DIFC, uh, it's not going to have a domestic component at all. As for procedure, Judge Stephen Chung has described the court as a careful marriage, a marriage between litigation and arbitration, trying to get the best from both. Um, this is sounding like an advance rather than a retreat to regular Singaporean Singapore litigation, um, at least on paper, at least on paper. And what's on paper is complicated. It is extremely difficult to get through uh, the legislation, so I'll give you a quick translation of the main working parts. The definition of an international case, I know you can, can't read that too well, uh, is similar to that we find in the model law. It's international, the case is international if the parties have their places of business in two different states, so maybe Canada and Singapore, or none of the parties to the claim has its place of business in Singapore, so it might be Canada and Vietnam. And three, at least one of the parties has its place of business in a state basically that's different from the locus of their business venture. Or the parties have expressly agreed that the subject matter relates to two different states uh, or more than one. Now it has to be commercial. And commercial gives us the same laundry list we're used to. A, a commercial transaction is, there's a long list up here, uh, supply of goods and services, distribution agreements, concessions, contracts, I'm sorry, construction, uh, investment, financing, banking, all those things, joint venture. Most important for, the, for anyone outside Singapore is what is an offshore case. Uh, an offshore case is a commercial action that in the words of the statute has no substantial connection to Singapore. And that means that Singapore law is not the law applicable to the dispute, and the subject matter is not regulated by Singapore law, or the only connections between the dispute and Singapore are the party's choice of Singapore law and submission to jurisdiction. So the, the court has jurisdiction over suitable cases, international, commercial, offshore, that are either transferred from the docket of the High Court by the Chief Justice, with consultation though, with the parties, and eventually found in clauses naming the SICC. Um, so far it's only been transferred cases, of course. The bench, unlike the other courts, the bench is uh, truly international. It consists of, I think, 19 Singapore High Court and Court of Appeal judges and 11 international judges from civil as well as common law jurisdictions, uh, including Dominique Acher from France, who is lectured here. Um, and I have little 
Facebook for you of, well, you can, these are the Asian, <laughs> these are the Singapore judges, uh, Chief Justice Menon on your right, and these are the international judges. Um, a lot of people ask, is this civil common law makeup window dressing? Uh, no, no it's not. The Chief Justice has highlighted the diversity of legal systems in ASEAN, which a lot of people don't know, and even that one third of the cases at the Singapore International Arbitration Center involve parties with civil law backgrounds. It's, in, it's important for us in Singapore uh, to have civil law competence. Uh, this distinguishes the Singapore court from the London court and somewhat from the Dubai court. It should make the Singapore court credible to potential litigants from civil law jurisdictions, which include, by the way, Korea and Indonesia. Uh, and I should have acknowledged earlier that we're here in Quebec, um, a civil law jurisdiction, sort of. Now the default is for first instance proceedings to be heard by one judge, but the Chief Justice can name a three judge panel or parties can ask for a three judge panel. And any judgment may be appealed, but the parties have the opportunity to limit or vary, to ask to limit or vary the scope of the appeal. And this this has led, I think, Chief, uh, not Chief, just Judge Stephen Chong to emphasize the value of this experienced and diverse a bench, sort of counterintuitive, in controlling costs. And I'll let you read this. He's put up that famous quote from Lord Mustel about why arbitration lacks, or arbitrators lack the ability to bang heads together uh, like judges can do. And in the Singapore court, there are experienced judges and litigators at the helm who can actually bang heads convincingly. There are other features of the court that are attractive for parties who like arbitration um, and litigation. There's limited discovery based on the IBA rules. There's confidentiality options for private hearings, restricted public release of information. Uh, confidentiality options, um, substitution of foreign rules of evidence. Now, as well as joinder and consolidation and access of foreign lawyers to the cases. So this is this marriage of arbitration and litigation. And I want to mention a couple. Evidence. I think it's extraordinary that legislation allows the SICC judges to use foreign rules of evidence in a Singapore high court case. This is novel, it's in advance. Uh, second, the role of foreign counsel. Parties can use foreign counsel of their choice within the relatively liberal rights of audience before the court. Foreign, law, foreign lawyers can register annually to appear in offshore cases. Those are the cases with no substantial connection to Singapore. It's easy to register, you have to be a lawyer somewhere and have five years experience in advocacy and not have been disbarred or censured. Uh, and you have to agree to abide by Singapore's code of legal ethics. Foreign lawyer may also get a limited registration to argue foreign law points in a specific case. Now these may seem, these, these rules of appearance may not seem enough to some, but you have to remember that foreign lawyers were allowed to practice in Singapore only starting in 2004, and second, the high court audience is limited to members of the Singapore bar, with the exception of foreign lawyers of eminent distinction admitted in practice. Um, and that's only leading English QCs in practice. Um, I won't go into detail, but I I will say the regulatory framework defines offshore cases quite broadly so that it's, it's not a substantial connection to Singapore if you have a witness in Singapore or funds in Singapore or a document in Singapore or one Singapore party. Nevertheless, foreign lawyers have been concerned that the court would define offshore cases very narrowly to protect the local bar. Um, so far that hasn't happened. The cases are only coming from transfers, of course, by now. There's no clauses for the SICC. So we can see how it's been operating in practice instead of on paper. 
Uh, and so far, the report card is good. The court received its first case in 2015, with a judgment coming in 2016. Uh, and when I was preparing for this lecture, I was really surprised to see there have been 10 judgments uh, and one appeal. Now, actually, that was May. Now it's 13 uh, and one. I won't go again into the, de into the details of the cases, but in the very first case, um, which involved a Singapore party and an Indonesian party, the Chief Justice named a three-judge panel, which included uh, Quentin Lo locally and Vivian Ramsey and Anselmo Reyes from Hong Kong, China. The judgment came out in favor of the Indonesian defendant and most important for present purposes, on application of the parties, the court decided certain questions of Indonesian law on submissions and certain questions by way of proof and pleading, combination, civil and common. Also on application, on application from the parties, the court granted confidentiality orders for certain documents to be sealed, to be reviewed in camera, uh, and cleared the courtroom for confidential discussions. The parties could have asked the court to redact any part of the judgment that was confidential or even postpone uh, publication for 10 years. The second case concerned, again, a Singapore party against an American party. And in that case, the plaintiff exercised the option to apply for a preliminary decision that it was not an offshore case, uh, that it was or was not, and Sir Bernard Eder from England, sitting alone, construed the test broadly and said there was no substantial connection to Singapore. The third case led to three decisions, uh, and that was interesting. It was a claimant from the BVI and China, and I'm sorry, the claimants were from BVI, and the defendants were from BVI, China, and the Dominican Republic. There, the plaintiffs had pledged $50 million worth of shares in a Singapore-listed company to the defendants as collateral for loans, but then went and sold all those pledged shares in the market, leading to a dispute. And in the first full judgment on liability, with Judge Patricia Bergen of Australia sitting, I think, the plaintiffs prevailed. Uh, the defendants applied for a stay of execution on the grounds that there was a risk that they wouldn't recover their costs if they prevailed on appeal because the plaintiffs weren't Singapore residents. And Judge Bergen dismissed this uh, in a very pointed ruling that said, if parties are going to embrace an international court to determine their dispute, uh, then they can't rely on the international status of one of the parties to claim that the orders of the court don't need to be followed. So that's one suspicion put to rest. Uh, there's another set of cases called the BNP Paribas cases, uh, where it's interesting that um, there was basically they put Dominique Hacher on the case because there was a French plaintiff, um, BNP Paribas, suing two Israeli siblings who had defaulted on personal guarantees on loans. Those defendants ran to Paris and tried to stop the Singapore action with a counter action, uh, which didn't happen. The uh, Singapore court would not issue a stay. Uh, the application was dismissed uh, on grounds that they had been manipulating uh, the system. And then in a, the first appeal, which was just a 14-page appeal, where these appeals were dismissed, the Singapore Court of Appeal, led by Chief Justice Menon, made pointed criticisms of the conduct of appellant's counsel, and those were Singaporean counsel, not foreign counsel, for um, surprising the other side. And I mention this only because it should be a warning and comfort to potential future parties uh, that there will be this rigorous application of due process in the court. So this quick run through of some of the cases and what we've seen happen 
uh, have led me to add to the list of legitimacy factors that I gave you from Judge Blair. And I'll mention a few new factors to think about in this debate. Public interest in public justice, safety net of appellate review, accountability of full-time judges, and independence of full-time judges. Uh, power to coerce, power to join parties, and a flexible approach to procedure. Uh, this is the marriage that we have been talking about. So the Singapore court is a different creature than international arbitration. It's different than Singapore litigation. Uh, it's a hybrid, and I consider it in, av in advance as a serious new option. Now, I know some of you are thinking, OK, what about the Speaking of creatures, what about the elephant in the room, or maybe here the moose in the room? Um, enforcement of the judgments. Uh, as I was saying to Pierre Olivier, I don't find this such a, a serious problem as others do, because if you put rogue states and claimants aside, the reality is that business to business parties generally comply with judgments and awards to get back to business. Uh, and even with the New York Convention in arbitration, the rogue outliers are going to run and hide for years and years from enforcement. Of course, the 2015 Hague Convention on choice of court clauses is a game changer and will be more of a changer uh, when more than 27, uh, I'm sorry, more than 30 parties sign it. Right now we've got the EU and 27 member states, Singapore uh, and Mexico. Others have, have signed it, the Ukraine and the US. Don't be looking for the US to ratify this anytime soon. Uh, and Canada is considering it. The more inclusive the convention, the more attractive international commercial courts will be for parties that simply tolerate international arbitration because of the New York Convention, but would rather have some protections of litigation. And that will be uh, in advance. Going forward, I predict a steady stream of cases to the Singapore court. We'll find out how problematic enforcement is. We'll probably see users, councils, uh, and we'll begin to see clauses. Actually, Pakistan has put the Singapore court as an optional avenue in their recent draft trade resolution act. Now, if I can have five more minutes. Not quite. Three, OK. Um, the first of my minutes, I tend to talk slowly, sorry. The, the first of my minutes, I will say, in preparing for this lecture, uh, I read a lot of theory, including Lon Fuller's uh, work on um, its limits, the um, forum and limits, forms and limits, sorry, in adjudication, uh, as well as Briarley's work and, and work on admissibility. And I, became, I came away impressed with the importance of permanence of a standing court as reflecting uh, power and policy and uh, bringing confidence. I'm going to skip uh, this quote from Yuval Shani uh, and, and conclude by saying this. There's going, I think we'll all agree, a lot, we'll all agree that global commerce will increase. Disputes are inevitable. They're particularly complicated internationally. Regular courts, domestic courts, are not acceptable often to resolve transnational disputes. Investor state treaty arbitration is self-correcting, but not fast enough to keep the investment court system away. Business actors want more effective and fair commercial arbitration. Therefore, there's room for first class international commercial courts as a new structure, a new option. Their constituency, as I say, is going to be the subgroup of transnational parties that want appellate rights, permanent rather than ad hoc judges, general transparency, and the related development of public jurisprudence and representation by regulated ethical counsel. Um, I now, having made myself do the research for this lecture, appreciate that the Singapore court is uniquely among the courts truly international. It's looking forward rather than backward. 
Uh, and with this marriage of litigation and arbitration, uh, it's found itself in the right place at the right time. Why do I say that? Uh, it's Asia, the market's growing, the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank estimates that by 2050, Asia will account for one half of global GDP, uh, trade and investment, and the One Belt, One Road initiative is going to involve four to six million dollars of infrastructure investment and a panoply, we can't even imagine the disputes that will need resolution and consistent resolution. That's another story. Uh, for now, I just want to say that the Singapore court is not likely to stay a dark horse for long. I think Professor Brierley would have been interested in its evolution. Uh, speaking of Professor Brierley, my spell check changes Brierley to briefly. Uh, I haven't been brief, but I will sit down. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for this uh, extraordinarily stimulating uh, lecture. Um, we, uh, we have, I wanted to make sure that we, uh, we have uh, enough time for a little bit of discussion uh, with the audience, so uh, I, I'm happy to uh, open up uh, the floor to uh, the audience for questions. I'll ask you to uh, stand up, uh, identify yourself and uh, speak loudly. Oh, I see we have a microphone available at the back, so you won't have to... Uh... You have been discussing whether the international court help or hinders dispute resolution. I have a somewhat related question, possibly, and that is, does the international court changes, or do the international court changes, help or hinder international trade and investment? And in that category, what does it do for the weaker, poorer groups of companies or nations? That's a... a that's a challenging question. It comes up, of course, in international investment arbitration as well, where I think the, it's too easy to say that having arbitration uh, in investment treaties is increasing foreign investment and public life of developing countries. Looking only at the court, I can imagine in the next few decades, and it's not short, that to have a public sitting court in Asia uh, where the ASEAN countries, including Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, have access to uh, a rigorous court for commercial disputes, it will improve uh, justice in those countries for parties from those countries in a way that ideally international arbitration could do, but it's not doing because of the transparency uh, and the control of costs. Fabian may disagree. Um, others, anyone can disagree. I have uh, Yves Fortier here. Lucy, this was a fascinating uh, lecture. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious about uh, one facet of the, uh, the Singapore court. Uh, supposing the, uh, the two uh, litigants uh, have uh, uh, have executed a, uh, an arbitration clause in uh, in their contract. Uh, well, I guess my first question is: Can they waive the application of uh, of, of the of the arbitration clause? And if they do not, will the Singapore court accept jurisdiction? It hasn't happened yet, but I, I am confident the answer is they could waive the arbitration clause and submit, if they meet the, the jurisdiction criteria, to the Singapore International Commercial Court, but the court would not take jurisdiction if the arbitration clause were extant. Yeah. Or if they, if they tried to, there would be a, a 
challenge and the court would dismiss the case. We have uh, Stephen Dreimer on my left. Thank you. I do have a question regarding uh, the, the Singapore court. Um, you mentioned very quickly appeals, uh, and appeals from this unique and innovative body go to the Singapore Court of Appeal. Uh, is that, I mean, I, I could see somebody suggesting that that might be a retreat from the advance of the court itself. Have you got a view on that? I should have added the fact that the international judges sit on the appeals. Uh, and the first appeal that happened did have one of the international judges, two Singaporean and one international judge. They comprise, they're members of the Supreme Court, which in Singapore has high court judges and court of appeal judges, and the international judges can all sit on appeal. So for that reason, I don't think it is a retreat to the Singaporean, pure Singaporean approach to appeal. I have uh, uh, Martin Valisek here uh, at the front. I, I, I have a question which is related to, to stay on the subject of the Singapore court. I was wondering if there'd been uh, discussions uh, about the enforcement problem, um, about in, uh, putting a, a, essentially a provision in the legislation stating that the judgments of the court will be deemed arbitral awards for the purpose of the New York Convention. and. That goes to the, uh, my, my overall question about the lecture. What is the difference between an arbitration that's recognized under the, the New York Convention and a court judgment? Answering in the order you, you raised that, th there are endless discussions in Singapore about enforcement issues to do with judgments of the Singapore International Commercial Court, which is a domestic uh, court. Singapore is not, as far as I can tell, not, at, not going to try the mechanism of just saying that a court judgment is an arbitration award. There are memoranda that are being exchanged with other countries. Uh, there's exploration of accelerating the Hague Convention, but no, they're not trying what the Dubai court is trying to just say, oh, miraculous, a judgment becomes uh, an arbitration award. And for those who are, are new to this, an arbit a commercial arbitration award is enforceable under the New York Convention almost all around the world, but there's no universal uh, enforcement of court judgment treaty, and some countries like the United States have no treaties for enforcement of foreign court judgments. So it is, it's a big plus and an important one, and one we should never lose for international arbitration to, um, to have the protection of the New York Convention. Thank you. Martin Valasek. Um, Lucy, I echo the comments of, uh, of Maître Fortier. Thank you for that great lecture. And I, I consider myself very lucky uh, as an alum of this faculty who had the, the honor of, uh, or the, the privilege really, of, uh, of uh, um, having Professor Briarly as a, as a professor. I also have the privilege of uh, playing hockey with his son, Tim, who's uh, in our room. So I, I have double, double Briarly privileges. Um, <laughs> I can, no, I, I, I think just one, maybe two parts. Um, one, of, uh, one of the advantages uh, that's touted for international arbitration is the, is the delocalized uh, nature of it, which uh, one of whose practical uh, manifestations is the ability to choose a seat um, that is convenient to the parties. Obviously, there's a certain constraint if you want to have an effective seat, but generally with the New York Convention, it's, it's generally, um, you know, um, understood that one can uh, pick a seat that's convenient to the parties geographically and, and for other reasons. Um, and of course, there's the, the rights of your counsel to appear there and the like. My question to you, I, I'm fascinated by, by uh, the advantages of, of the, the SIC, of the, the Singapore International uh, Commercial Court. Do you think that it's reproducible uh, in a sufficient number of places that it could um, substitute for that convenience of the delocalized aspect of international arbitration because Singapore is far. Um, and for those of us who are on this continent or South America and elsewhere, I do think that it is, um, 
it, it's, uh, it's the, the, the Singapore International Commercial Court may be like one of those jewels behind the window, which, is, which we would all like to have, uh, but which is simply inaccessible because it is so far or whatever it might be. So you did have a map where you had a number of competitors and you ably criticized why they might not be up to the task or they're, they're not there. Would anyone else be? Singapore is quite a unique place. Um, and so will it be um, an advance for some for whom it's accessible and for the rest of us, will we, will we be relegated to, uh, to international arbitration? A very good question. My view is that the, the Singapore court is only going to be uh, beneficial to parties that are either commercial parties that are Asian or dealing with Asian parties. So sorry to say that, Martin, that if, if you're representing a Canadian company in a huge transaction in uh, Myanmar or Vietnam uh, with no substantial connection to Singapore, then you might have to come all the way to Singapore, closer to Vietnam. So that's the same with with arbitration sometimes. But I, it's not going to be an obvious place for a Canadian US dispute to want to travel to, to Singapore. Uh, I played with the idea of doing a slide with the idea, because I don't think there should be dozens and dozens and maybe more scores of international investment courts. You know, you can't have a, I don't think it's helpful to have, have a whole panoply, but you could imagine a, a globe where there's the London Commercial Court, it's been since 1895, hasn't hurt London as an arbitration seat, by the way, and Singapore for Asia, and Dubai for the Gulf, and maybe, you know, the Latin, there could be a Latin American and Ohada. So there'd be four or five. If, if they work, uh, if they work, and uh, produce high quality, high quality judgments relatively quickly. But I also think, and this is unspoken, that this is all good for international arbitration. Uh, all these criticisms and these reforms and the competition because those of us in the field are, are looking for advances on efficiency and location and everything else. So it's, it's a win-win to a certain extent. Yeah, Gisev, well, has a question for you. I'm actually going to take Martin's second question and, and build on, on his, his question. A um, little bit of a preface first. As Lucy has said, that the Hague Convention on, on choice, choice of Forum creates a very similar system to the New York Convention for commercial disputes in front of commercial courts. And we, we only have 30 ratifications at some point, uh, at, at this point. Uh, well, it's in force. It's in force. But, but well, that, that goes to, to my question, which is, are we... At a, at a juncture right now where, as lawyers, we're, whether we define ourselves as arbitration practitioners or international dispute resolution practitioners, are we ready when we intervene at the end of the contract negotiation and they say, okay, can you advise us on the arbitration clause? Are we ready now to, to start talking about, oh, well, you know, you should really consider the SICC or uh, the commercial division of the Quebec Superior Court or the commercial list of the Ontario Superior Court, which are commercial commercial courts, as within the, the framework of the Hague Convention and would be actually enforceable in a very similar manner to an international arbitration award in one of the parties that has uh, ratified the, the Hague Convention. So the question is, you know, are we ready to start advising on that or we still need more ratification beyond Europe and Mexico, um, and maybe there's one or two more, but are we ready to basically tell clients, well, there's another regime, you know, the international commercial courts, or just, you know, the commercial courts in whatever jurisdiction that you're comfortable with that could compete with arbitration. And really, it's, it's a, we'll weigh the pros and cons, and, and it's up to you to decide. Well, I don't think we're ready. Uh, I don't think we're anywhere near ready yet. There has to be much more of a, of a track record of um, the courts and enforcement and what happens with the Hague Convention. I think what we might see is parties post-dispute, uh, to go back to Eve's question, saying if, they've, if they have the right geometry that they, they come from the countries and they haven't been reorganized to some other countries that aren't signatories to the Hague Convention, that they would agree voluntarily 
to, to go to a court, but no, we're not ready. And um, I was saying to Pierre Olivier before this lecture that Singapore doesn't fail in dispute resolution and the court, the cases are being very carefully selected to test the on paper attractions of the Singapore International Court, you know, off, this offshore case and this and that and planning, again, it's probably decades before there start to be many cases um, that go. It would be risky to advise your clients now if you, well, I'm giving legal advice, which I'm not supposed to do, not being a registered foreign lawyer. Pay no attention. <laughs> okay, there, uh, there, there are many more uh, questions uh, I see, but unfortunately we're running out of, uh, of time. The, the, the good thing is that we can continue the discussion outside of this room uh, more informally. Uh, so it remains for me to uh, thank uh, our speaker for this wonderful uh, lecture and to help us uh, commemorate uh, the life and work of John E. C. Brierly. Uh, she did so with, uh, with poise, with uh, depth, and with imagination. Thank you, Professor Reed. Je voudrais, euh, je voudrais également remercier euh, ceux et celles qui ont assuré la logistique et l'organisation euh, matérielle de cette conférence. Euh, Libby Parker, Maria Markeski, Ben Jarvis et surtout euh, Giacomo Marchisio euh, qui est ici. Je voudrais finalement euh, remercier de, de tout cœur, euh, très très sincèrement, nos très fidèles euh, parrain pour, le, pour la conférence uh, John E. C. Brierley. The, le cabinet Woods uh, has been uh, supporting us for uh, many years in this endeavor uh, and uh, they're always uh, here for us uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, give uh, the microphone to Stephen Drymer uh, uh, who will invite you to the cocktail. Well, thank you, uh, Fabien. Um, Lucy began uh, with a paradox. Let me uh, share one with you, if you don't mind, um, assuming it's somewhat appropriate. It was only when I opened the program uh, about five minutes ago uh, that I learned that I was to deliver an appreciation, <laughs> not simply invite you all to a cocktail hosted by, uh, hosted by Woods. Um, and so I find myself in the, in the difficult position of anybody who stands up at the end. I'm standing between you and your drinks. Um, uh, but uh, I'd also like to share a few words of appreciation, if I may, um, having grabbed a pen from uh, the woman at the back. Yes, I still have it. I'll give it back to you. And having sent off a rather unappreciative email to Fabien earlier on to say, why, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> um, uh, four points I'd like to uh, share with you that struck me. Lucy is, of course, perfectly placed to speak to us about the subject that she addressed today. She is uh, a famed and famously effective advocate um, uh, before tribunals in international commercial and international investment treaty disputes. Um, uh, second, uh, she knows whereof she speaks. Um, and I note, among other things, her uh, lack of fear to engage on subjects where angels uh, frequently fear to tread. And I mean the angels, so to speak, of the international commercial uh, and investment treaty arbitration world. Um, to raise the issue of the bleeding into international commercial investment of the critique, often shrill, but nonetheless uh, uh, reasonable in certain aspects, of uh, international investment treaty arbitration. Um, I note as well uh, her thesis that international businesses expect and deserve an array of options to resolve their disputes. Now that I find uh, perhaps goes without saying, but it's refreshing among other things if one recalls that not so many years ago uh, a, a Briarly lecture was devoted to, by Jan Paulsen was devoted to the theme that international arbitration is not arbitration, by which he meant that there is really no genuine choice to be made. There is only one game in town these days, and that's international arbitration. Uh, fourth, I note Lucy's insistence 
um, uh, that answers to some of the questions that she raised, if not all of the questions that she raised, lie not in old bromides, and that new thinking and new solutions uh, are necessary. Um, uh, and uh, she is not at all uh, 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 shy about vaunting uh, an innovative institution, um, such as the unfortunately acronymed SICK, but one which uh, I imagine um, rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, even in Singapore, and not to speak internationally. Um, on that basis, allow me to conclude uh, by thanking Lucy uh, for, at once, uh, a lecture that I found uh, refreshing, erudite, engaging, and thoroughly delightful. If I may, and if it's not too inappropriately acronymed, a true read performance. Thank you very much. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to invite you all to a cocktail being held where exactly, uh, Giacomo? Uh, in the atrium, uh, sponsored by Woods. I look forward to seeing you all there. Merci Fabien. Thank you.